Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's really lovely to be with you. And um, I've spoken at this church on Zoom before a number of times, but never been here in person. So it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here. Lovely to be with you this morning earlier to remember the Lord Jesus in his death. And lovely to be here to open the word of God uh, with you this morning. I'd like to ask you to turn, please, to the book of Psalms. To the book of Psalms. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at two short Psalms today. And it's Psalms 133 and 134. And we're going to look at these with the Lord's help together. Just want to introduce myself to those who don't uh, know me. My name is Ian Jameson and my wife Rebecca and I uh, lived in Fife in fact until uh, about a year ago. We lived in Thornton and um, we then moved to uh, Renfrewshire to Erskine where my wife comes from uh, about last December or so. And uh, so we live there and we go to Albert Hall Evangelical Church in Renfrew and I want to bring you greetings from all the Lord's people there uh, this morning. So Psalm 133 and 134 and let me just pray uh, before we have a look at these Psalms together. Almighty God and dear Heavenly Father, as we quieten our hearts now and we come before the open pages of your word, Lord we thank you. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for its clarity. We thank you for its truth and for its power. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who we've been singing about this morning. We praise you for his greatness and his majesty, his kindness and his love. We thank you that he went to the cross of Calvary and there he died to pay the price for sin. We thank you that he's alive today and we thank you that he's coming again soon. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worshipping him this morning and now to hear from your precious word, we ask that the Holy Spirit himself would do his great work of leading us into all truth, that he himself would be our teacher, that you'd help us to listen and to perceive truth from your word and to put it into practice, that we might have, have ready hands and feet to do your will, our God. So we thank you, Father, and ask for your blessing now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 So let me read uh, the first of these Psalms together, Psalm 133. And both of these Psalms are very significant because they come at the end of a special group of Psalms. The Psalms 150 songs of the nation of Israel, songs of praise, songs of lamentation, uh, whole, uh, the whole spectrum of human emotion is found in the book of Psalms. But there's a special group of Psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 that we call the Psalms of Ascent. The Psalms of Ascent. And these were the Psalms that were sung by the children of Israel as they made their way up to the mountain of the temple. They made their way up to the temple into Jerusalem to worship God. And there is a progression in these Psalms so that by the time we get to these last two Psalms of Ascent, we've made our way with the children of Israel right into the city of Jerusalem. That's the one we're about to read, Psalm 133. Imagine the city of Jerusalem full of people who've come from all over the Mediterranean to worship God. A bustling, busy, exciting place. That's what Psalm 133 is all about. And then Psalm 134, we're actually right into the temple. Right into the temple itself. We're going to see that in just a moment or two. The Psalms of Ascent are actually referred to elsewhere in the book of Psalms. Back in Psalm 42, uh, which is a Psalm of the Sons of Asaph, the, um, the writer says, you know, uh, my heart pants for the word of God, for streams of living water. And then he talks about those past days when he'd known God's goodness. And he talks about going up with multitude, keeping festival, singing songs of joy and praise. And it's these Psalms that he was referring to, that the Psalmist was referring to. So let's read Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Amen. And God will add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. If I was to give a, a title to both of these Psalms, and we'll read the second one in a few moments time, I would call Psalm 133 the condition for the blessing of God. The condition for the blessing of God. And Psalm 134 I would maybe call the call to the blessing of God. The call to the blessing of God. I want us to see four things together in this Psalm, Psalm 133. And it's all about one theme. One lovely theme, it's a beautiful theme for Christians to think about, and that is the theme of unity. The theme of unity. 
That's what Psalm 133 is all about. I want us to think firstly about the virtue of unity. That unity is essentially virtuous. It's a good thing. And then secondly, I want us to see the value of unity. Just how valuable, just how precious is unity in the sight of God. And then thirdly, I want us to see a vision of unity. Because this psalm is very visual. And then lastly, I want us to see God's verdict on unity. God's verdict on unity. What does God say here in this psalm about unity? So first of all, the virtue of unity. And let me take you back to the verse uh, number one of this psalm. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. The first word of the psalm is the word behold, behold. Now, uh, our brother Charles uh, this morning uh, talked about the word sila, which is found in the psalms. Not in these two psalms, but found often in the psalms. And it's a word that, as our brother said, it means really to, to, to cause you to pause and to consider the weight of what you've just heard. Well, that's about what you've heard and what you've read. The word behold is a very similar word, but it's about what you see. It's about what you see. So when a psalm begins with behold, and interestingly, these are the only two uh, that begin with that. Uh, in the King James Version, they both begin with that word behold. You stand back and you look. You see, you observe, because this psalm is very visual. This psalm paints a vivid and exciting picture for us of unity. So we need to have our eyes open. We need to have our eyes wide open as we look at this psalm together. That's why it starts in that way. And then we're told that it's good and it's pleasant when brothers dwell together in unity. And this, of course, is not about brothers in a family, although it's good and pleasant when brothers in a family get on as well. But it's about brothers in the Lord. Good and pleasant. Is that just repetition? Is that just, you know, it's good and it's pleasant, you know, the one and the same thing? Well, no, they're not quite the same thing because I could take you to... Uh, a mother with a, a little child and the child's not feeling so well and uh, the mother says now I have to give you this medicine and uh, it's not going to taste very nice I'm afraid and uh, you're going to pull a face when you when you have to take it and you're not going to want to have to take it but it's good for you it's good for you you've got to take this medicine because it's good for you but then on the other hand I could take you to a particular drawer in my kitchen full of chocolates and treats and biscuits and things and it's very pleasant it's very very pleasant but it's not necessarily good for you not necessarily good for you all things in moderation i suppose uh, i should learn anyway we have things that are good and things that are pleasant but unity is both unity among christian people is both good for us it's good medicine for us it's good that we should be united but also friends it's very pleasant it's very enjoyable. And every Christian here today, and I'm not sure that everybody here is a born-again Christian. I don't know because this is my first visit here. But every Christian here today probably knows at some point in their Christian experience what it's like to be united. To have a feeling of unity with your fellow believers. And it's very, very enjoyable. It's pleasant. It's a lovely thing to feel united in the Lord Jesus and united in purpose and united in vision. And yet, on the other hand, of course, we all know what it's like when it's not there. And we all know how unpleasant it can be when you're in a group, a Christian group, a fellowship of one kind or another, and there's not unity. And sometimes, we wish it wasn't like this, but sometimes in life and in the Christian life, we don't know what we've got until it's gone. Unity is very precious. It's very enjoyable, but when it's gone, we recognise how precious it is. There's a wonderful commentator, one of my favourites, Graham Scroggie, who was uh, an Edinburgh, well, he, he laboured in Edinburgh for a number of, of years anyway. And uh, he suggests that this psalm would have been very, very uh, applicable and used in one particular experience in the nation of Judah. And I want to take you to it. And it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Now, in the southern kingdom of Judah, there were some godly kings. There was a mixture, a mixed bag. Some kings were very good, some kings were very bad. Here was a godly king, King Hezekiah. And he discovers that the feast of Passover, one of the central feasts that God had given to his ancient people, that, um, that the feast of Passover had not been celebrated as it should have been for decades. It had been neglected. It had been left, it had been left to, to gather dust, as it were, in their national life. And he says, no, we need to start this up again. We need to celebrate Passover again. But then he takes it a step further. Because he doesn't just invite everybody in Judah to celebrate the Passover. 
He takes it a step further. Let's read about it. It will not take long to explore this. I just want to observe it with you. But read verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 30. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. For the king and his princes and all the assembly of Jerusalem had taken counsel to keep the Passover in the seventh month. Then down to verse 5. So they decreed to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan, that the people should come and keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel, at Jerusalem, for they had not kept it as often as prescribed. Now when it says that this proclamation was to be made from Beersheba to Dan, that's a little bit like saying, now I'm from Inverness, and a lot of people think that Inverness is right at the top, but there's nothing else after that. But of course, there's two and a half hours worth of driving north of Inverness, up to Thurso and Wick and all that. Now, saying from Beersheba to Dan is a little bit like saying the proclamation, the invitation to Kelty Evangelical Church this morning is going to be sent from Wick or Thurso or John of Rhodes to Gretna, to Gretna. From the north to the south, this invitation was to go out to everybody. Now, that's a very unusual move. It doesn't sound unusual to us. But, you know, these two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, had been separated, had been at war, had been at enmity with one another for decades by this point. And Hezekiah is saying, do you know what? I want us to restart celebrating the Passover, and I want to take it a step further. I want to invite anybody from the northern kingdom that wants to come. If anybody from the north has it on their heart to come and celebrate the Passover with us, the doors are open. They're welcome. And you can imagine some of his courtiers or those around him saying, Hezekiah, it's a bad move. It's a bad move. They'll laugh you to scorn. They'll never come. Nobody from that God-forsaken place in the north will ever come down here and celebrate the Passover. Well, let's read on. And we'll read from verse 10. So the couriers went from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Now, friends, um, you have people here that are involved in open air uh, preaching, and I would be involved a little bit with that too, down in the, in the sort of Glasgow and Paisley area. And sometimes you'll speak to people about the gospel of the Lord Jesus, this wonderful good news, the best news there could ever be, that Jesus loved us and died for us and rose again, and, and they'll laugh at you mm. and mock you to scorn. There's always a divided reaction to the gospel of the Lord Jesus. There's always a divided reaction to the gospel. Some people will accept it. Some people will take it on board. Some people will believe it and it will change their lives forever. And some people will reject it and mock it and scorn it. Well, there were two reactions here too. So some scorned and mocked. And you can imagine the courier saying, Hezekiah, we told you it would be like this. We told you you shouldn't have invited those scoundrels in the northern kingdom. They're never going to come. And they've done exactly what we told you they would do. But that's not the end of the story, because in verse 11 we read this. However, some men of Asher, of Manasseh and of Zebulun, humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart. There's a picture of unity. One heart to do what the king and the prince is commanded by the word of the Lord. So I just want you to imagine this for a moment. Jerusalem, that great city, is full of people. It's bustling. It's heaving with people and people that haven't seen anybody from the southern kingdom for generations they've been separate up there in israel not judah they've come down they've humbled themselves when they heard the invitation maybe unexpectedly to even their own heart there was something within just something within that said you need to respond to this something within that said you need to do something about this you know evangelical churches like the one that Rebecca and I belong to, like this one here, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, evangelical churches, they make the invitation of the gospel week in and week out and week in and week out, saying to men and women, boys and girls, in Kelty, in Renfrewshire, wherever, you can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It is possible for anybody to be forgiven of all of their sin through placing their faith and trust in Jesus. That invitation still stands good today, in 2024, just as it did when the Lord Jesus first told his followers to issue the invitation. I wonder what your response has been thus far to the invitation. There might be people here today who've actually heard the invitation many times. They may even have heard it here before. I don't know, as I say, this is my first visit here to speak. So I don't know, maybe you've heard the invitation here at Kelty before. 
I wonder if you've responded. I wonder if you've humbled yourself and come. Anyway, this is a picture of unity. Brothers dwelling together in unity, and it's a wonderful picture. So, the first point is this, that unity is virtuous. Well, how do we achieve it? Well, that's a question for later on. And we know as well from John 17 that it pleases the Lord. It pleases the Lord. John 17, the Lord Jesus, very profound chapter. The Lord Jesus is praying in what we call the high priestly prayer. And he's there praying to the Father. And to my judgment, it's probably the, the chapter that opens up the window on the Trinity for us to the greatest extent to see what it's like for the Son to interact with the Father. And there he is and he says, I pray that they may be one, even as we are one. And how wonderful this morning to have unity around the Lord Jesus. Well, let's look now at the value of unity and I'll take you back to the psalm for a moment. How valuable is unity? Well, chapter, uh, sorry, verse two paints the picture for us. It is like, so we're supposed to imagine this, it is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's a picture we're not so familiar with today. Uh, we don't have priests uh, in this Old Testament sense around us today. And this is a picture that maybe we just need to explain to us a little bit. It's a picture of priesthood, of a priest being anointed with oil. Now, I'm not going to get too complicated here, so I'm not going to ask you to turn to Exodus 29, but if we did, go back to Exodus 29. That's the chapter in God's Word where God says, I want you to separate from me a special class of people who are going to be priests for me, so that worship can be given to me in heaven in a way that I can accept and still be holy and righteous. So he established a priesthood. But he said there's a few things you need to do to them to turn them from ordinary men into priests. And I just want to point out a few of them here. The first is that a sacrifice had to be made. Sacrifice had to be made. Second thing is they had to be washed. They had to be cleansed. The third thing is they had to be robed. Lastly, they had to be, sorry, but ultimately they had to be crowned. And then lastly, they had to be anointed. And I won't get too complex about this, but for every Christian here today, for every Christian here today, those things have happened to us to we have been had a sacrifice made on our behalf not the sacrifice of bulls or goats or lambs or turtle doves but the sacrifice of jesus christ on the cross the precious lamb of god he died on the cross because he loves us to pay the price for all our wrongdoing all of our sin all of our wickedness that sacrifice has been made we've been washed cleansed of all our sin i wonder if there's anybody here today who who isn't in that position and you haven't you haven't been washed, you haven't been cleansed of your sin. And then they were robed, and, and Christians are robed with Christ's righteousness. All of the, the goodness and purity of his life has been made over to me and to us as Christians. And, and then we've been crowned with glory and honour, and we've been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Every Christian, when they're born again, is anointed with the Holy Spirit of God. So we're priests in the royal household of God. You don't have a priest here at Kelpie Evangelical Church. We don't have one at Albert Hall. Why? Because we have one great high priest in heaven. That's the only priest we need. And also every man, woman, boy or girl who places their faith and trust in Jesus is that very moment a priest in the royal household of God. But the picture isn't just of the priest. It's also of the oil. You see, the last stage was that the priest was anointed and the oil would be poured on the head and run down the whole body. Just imagine the oil coming down the beard and down all the clothes. What about this oil then? Well, the next chapter in Exodus, Exodus chapter 30, again, we won't turn there for sake of time. The Exodus chapter 30 tells us about the oil and exactly how it's to be made. And you know, what we see there and, and all through uh, that section of the book of Exodus is that God, our God who placed the stars into space and, and formed the mountains and the hills and the valleys and all that we see around us and is in charge of the war in Ukraine and in charge of what's going on in the Middle East, this great universal God, He's also a God of intricate detail, who cares about details. He says, this oil I want you to make, I want you to make it exactly according to my recipe. This many spices of that type, and that many spices of this type. What does that tell me? That tells me that this universal God who's in control of all things also cares about the small things of our lives. And this God who's in charge of the whole universe knows what you're going through today. I don't know you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the, trou the troubles and strains. You might be sitting here 
this morning and you're just doing your very best to, to try and concentrate because your mind is absolutely taken up with stress of one kind or another. God knows about it all. And he cares about it all. But he says three very important things about this oil. He says, firstly, it's precious. It's very precious, this oil, that you anoint the priests with. Secondly, it's very holy. It's absolutely holy. Thirdly, it must be protected and never imitated. Never imitated. Don't try and imitate the oil. Don't make oil that's like it. Just leave it alone. God's recipe. Don't tamper with it. And don't try to make something similar. Just stick with the oil that God has given. It affects the whole of the body of the priest. The oil goes all the way down from head to foot. Unity affects the whole body of Christ. But you know, there are imitation oils. What do I mean by that? Well, mankind has sought to try and bring about <coughs> unity in the church with man-made methods. With methods that, that man's come up with. Not the methods that God has come up with and not the design that God has for his church, but but ideas and, and organisations that, that man comes up with to try and bring about unity and, and they might have very good uh, motives, you see. Three of them that I just want to point out without getting too complicated. The first is what we call the ecumenical movement. We call it the ecumenical movement, bit of a long word, etc. But the ecumenical movement is this idea that, that the whole church worldwide, and by that I mean everybody that would call themselves Christians, every church that would call themselves a Christian church, the whole worldwide church should just become one universal church. One universal church. And all the differences and all the distinctions and all the, the doctrines that you and I might hold that are different from other people who would say that they're Christians, we just squash them all down to the lowest common denominator and form one big global church. And you can understand, I suppose, part of the motivation behind it because they say, well, look, there's the desire of the Lord Jesus in John 17, just as you said, that they may be one as we are one. Let's go about it. Let's organise it. Let's have conferences. Let's have uh, big uh, conventions and we'll make the church one. But the problem is, friends, that the things that we do believe here uh, in the church that Rebecca and I go to, in the church that, that's here in Kelty, they're very important. They're very important. And you can't compromise on these doctrines that we really hold to very strongly. So the ecumenical movement, we, we reject that one. But then the second one is what they call sometimes denominations denominations and that's the idea that that you you take a name you take a name uh, and you, you gather yourself around that name and uh, and there are other churches that are similar to you and you gather together and you say well well we're all sorted now and we, we make a fellowship or a federation or a, a union of types of churches but the problem with that is maybe it sounds like a good idea to start with but the problem with that is that then you've divided the body of Christ so then there are those that are inside those that are outside. And then the third one is what we call sectarianism. And that's the idea that, well, we know that we're right here, so we'll pull up the drawbridge and everybody else is wrong. And we're actually the church and everybody else is outside. So all these three man-made types of oil, if you like, we reject them all. They're all wrong. They're all wrong in their own way. Might be motivated by good things, but, but they're all wrong. What we have in the New Testament is this beautiful picture of unity. See, here's Kelty Evangelical Church, and it exists, the Bible tells us, as a distinct witness before God. The book of Revelation talks about seven churches, and each of those churches has a lampstand of its own. This church has a lampstand of its own. This church has a witness and testimony of its own before God. And then there's the universal body of Christ, and that's a wonderful thing. You see, I don't belong to the same local church as you do. I'm not part of Kelty Evangelical Church. I'm part of Albert Hall over in Renfrew. So we're not part of the same local church, but, but praise the Lord, I am part of the same body that you are, in the universal body of Christ. The very moment a man, woman, boy, or girl places their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, they become a permanent member of the body of Christ worldwide. Certain things, sad things can happen in a local church, which means that somebody has to leave that local church, but they never have to leave the body of Christ. So this is the wonderful picture of unity that the Bible paints for us. It's very valuable. It's virtuous, yes, it's valuable. It's spiritual, it's not organisational. You can't organise true unity. It comes about from God, it comes down from heaven, not up from man. Well, thirdly, there's a vision of unity. So look with me to verse 3. It's like the Jew of Hermon. So now the, the metaphor changes. First of all, it's 
oil going down a priest. Now it's dew. The dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. Now Hermon, is, there's not permanently snow on Mount Hermon, but almost permanently snow on Mount Hermon. So there you are in the Middle East, it's mostly very dry and arid. And here's this mountain that's almost permanently got snow on it. And so bit by bit by bit, <laughs> drip by drip, water is coming from that mountain. That eventually through the water table and all the processes of, um, that, that we all know about from school, etc. Of the water table, they come down and they water the fields of Zion and the surrounding area. The idea here is that unity is something which blesses the whole body of Christ. It affects the whole body. The wonderful picture of unity here. And with it comes, what do you need dew for? What do you need water for? Life and refreshment. Life and refreshment. And along with unity, in local Christian bodies, local Christian fellowships, comes life and comes refreshment. And the opposite is also true. Without unity in this local assembly, without unity in mind, where I belong to, we will have death and dryness. Death and dryness without unity around the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'd like to turn now to the next little psalm, Psalm 134. Just three verses, and I'll read it now. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place, and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Lovely little psalm. So if that first psalm there was the condition for the blessing of God, I'll just go back one verse. You see, at the end of Psalm 133, there's a statement here. And uh, I just missed this out there. The verdict that God has on unity, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. You see, if we want to have blessing as a local church in Renfrew, if we want to know the blessing of God, we must be united together around Christ. And then when we are, and we're enjoying that unity and that life and that refreshment, God himself commands a blessing. Well, Psalm 134 then is about the blessing of God. And here we move from the bustling city of Jerusalem into the temple itself. And Graham Scroggie, that same commentator, suggests that what we have here is actually a call and response. So I want you to imagine this. Use your Holy Spirit-inspired imaginations. And I want you to imagine it, that we're in the temple, that great temple in Jerusalem. And the congregation, the congregation have finished their worship. The day's worship is over and we're all about to leave. We're all together in the temple, we're all about to leave. And we turn, as we're going out the door, we turn and we say to those who are taking over the night duties of the priests and Levites, we say to them, come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. And then, as we're about to leave, those Levites, those priests who are about to take over the service, they say to us, may the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. This is the call to the blessing of God. Worship is our eternal privilege. You know, there are certain things that a church does that are temporary. We met together this morning to break bread and to drink wine, uh, as every church, every New Testament church does. But we won't always do that. We won't always do that. It's temporary. It's coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ will return, and we won't do that anymore. This church baptizes people when they have become Christians. So once you become a Christian, the very next stage is that you should be baptised. I wonder if there's anybody here this morning who is a Christian, who's born again, who's placed their faith and trust in Jesus, but you've not yet been baptised. Well, the Lord Jesus asks us to. It's a step of obedience, and it's what we must do next. Once we've been saved, we must then be baptised. So may I just challenge you this morning, if you've been saved, not yet baptised, that is the next thing that the Lord is asking of you, to be baptised. But we won't always do that forever, will we? We won't always do that forever because one day everybody will be saved in a coming day in heaven. But the, the last thing, the other thing we do is that we evangelize. This church does that. My church does that. We all seek to do that as Christians. We seek to make the gospel known. Why? Why? We don't earn points from heaven for preaching the gospel, for trying to share Christ with other people because we love him. Because we love him and because we love people who don't know Christ. We love them for love of him and we want them to know about the gospel. But we won't always do that. The day for making Christ known is now. And one day the time will be up. Three things in the psalm as we close. The servants, the sanctuary, and the source. Well, we've seen the servants. There they are, priests. And we've already learned that we are priests in the royal household of God. 
and worship is our eternal privilege. You see, all those things that a local church does are temporary, but, but one million years from now, we'll still be worshipping him. We'll still be worshipping him. So worship is absolutely eternal, unchanging and unending joy for God's people. Secondly, the sanctuary. Not just any servants, these are the servants in the holy place. In the holy place. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, tells us all about this. We won't turn there for the sake of time. But it says that we as Christians are like living stones. And we're being built up into a holy temple for the Lord. And that in that temple there are priests and they're offering spiritual sacrifices to God. What does it tell us? It tells us. That as believers in Jesus, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you are a stone making up the temple. You're part of the temple, the sanctuary of God. You're the priest in the temple and you're the sacrifice the, the, the priest is offering. Because we're told numerous times in the New Testament that the sacrifice is ourselves. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God. And then we finish with the source of blessing. This is the last thing that the, uh, the, the temple servants say. They say, may the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Points forward to the one who will come, the one who will come from Zion, the Lord Jesus Christ, a Jew, a man uh, from Jewish extraction, coming from Zion, blessing the Lord. You know, here we are, and I've come here, drove here from Erskine this morning, and uh, I'm a Gentile, and the vast majority of you here will be Gentiles. I'm not sure if there's any Jewish people here today but most of us will be Gentiles and yet we love Jesus we love the Messiah of the Jewish people this is God's grace to us we shouldn't know him we shouldn't we shouldn't love him here we are in 2024 the world says he's dead and gone and irrelevant and here we are and we love him that's why we've come here this morning I trust one day the Lord Jesus is going to return to take us home and then he's going to return with us to establish his kingdom for a thousand years and he's going to bless the world from Zion he's going to reign from that great city if you think about unity I just want to take you to uh, a verse or a couple of verses in Philippians as we close and there are verses that I love and I often uh, quote them when I'm writing to people uh, especially to other Christians or uh, exclusively to other Christians in Philippians chapter 1 and uh, I'm reading this from the ESV. Philippians chapter 1, and we'll read from verse 3. I thank my God, says Paul, in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Why? Why is he so thankful for these people? He says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So friends, I'm not very well known to the people here. I know Charles a fair bit, and I know Hank a little bit, and John, and, but I don't know you all very well. And yet you've asked me to come here from, from Renfrew to come and speak to you today. And any of you believers here at Kelty would be so welcome at Albert Hall Evangelical Church if you're ever on holiday in the area or visiting. Why? Why would you be so welcome? And why have you made me so welcome today? And why have I enjoyed my time with you so much? Because of this partnership in the gospel. It's not man-made, it's not organised, nobody told John to invite me, it's not an organisation that, that made this connection happen here today, it comes from heaven and it's partnership in the gospel in a person. Hmm. I wonder if you know what the gospel is, I wonder if you've responded to that invitation to a God who loves you, loves you with an everlasting love, sent his son to die on the cross for you, to shed his blood for you, he rose again from the dead and still today in 2024 he's offering forgiveness of sin to anybody who will place their faith and trust in Jesus. Have you done that? Have you done that? And if you have done that, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus and he's your saviour, have you been baptised? And have you become part of a local church that loves the Lord? Let's pray together, shall we? <coughs> Almighty God and dear Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks for the blessing and privilege of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the unity that only he can bring. We thank you for how precious that unity is to you. And Lord, we pray that each one of us here today, we might be a force for unity in our local fellowship. We thank you for the universal body of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Thank you for the privilege of membership to it. But we thank you also for local churches. And we pray for this local church here in Kelty. And we ask for your blessing upon it. And we pray, Lord, for its spiritual prosperity in the days that lie ahead. We pray that it would go from strength to strength in joy and service for the Lord Jesus. And we pray for unity here and at my own assembly back home. And in every place where the Lord Jesus Christ is honoured in this country, we ask for unity. What a blessing it is. How good and how sweet it is. And so, Father... We ask for your blessing today. We pray for those particularly who might be here today who don't know the Lord Jesus and who've never yet responded to this invitation of the gospel. Oh, Father, touch their hearts. Show them that they are sinners and that they do need a saviour and that you, Father, in your love have provided just one saviour for all sinners for all time who loves them, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that today they might make the decision to simply trust him for their salvation. Father, we pray for anybody here today who is saved but not yet baptised. We ask that today they would make the decision to obey the Lord in what he's asked of them. So, Father, we thank you for local churches. We thank you for this local church. And we ask for your blessing upon us as we part. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.